Praise God, it's uh, Thursday, the 18th of <clears throat> June, 2020, and uh, it's good to be back uh, broadcasting again live for First Gospel Church, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. So, uh, it's good to be here. Appreciate the Lord today. Greetings in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Notice I said in the name of the just one name. Anyway, it's, um, it's good to be back again this evening. <clears throat> uh, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I don't know of any dire urgency right this minute for prayer, but Anyway, I just want to welcome everyone and greet everyone. And, <clears throat> and um, I, uh, I wanted to, I thought I might say something, <clears throat> you know, this evening. I've been working on the, uh, on Thursday nights in the past, I've been working on the succession of a prophetical events that has to take place before the end of the Gentile world. And I pretty well have went through that. And uh, one of the things that we're, we have in our plans is, is to begin uh, with the Dominican Republic giving that secession of things. One of the things is I've that's holding us back right now. My interpreter, Brother Emilio Green, is um, he, his his phone is kind of well. In fact, he he uh, someone stole his phone, and he's got a little old cheap phone. But for us to get on Zoom or or, or Google Meet to have meetings that way, where he everyone can see me and him, where he can interpret. <laughs> For the people in the Dominican Republic, he has to at least have a phone. He doesn't have a computer or an iPad. And so I'm going to have to get him signed. He's going to have to have a fairly decent phone to do that. And so we're looking for him one. Uh, so hopefully we'll find something for him here in the near future and, and we can get started on that. They're wanting me to... Uh, <clears throat> go through the book of Revelation with them uh, chapter and verse and <clears throat> I think that would be a good uh, exercise for me since I'm right now in the process of writing a book on a commentary of my per present position on the book of Revelation and, and so uh, for those of you that would like to listen into that when we start it, we'll announce it. And uh, I'm not sure if we'll do that. Probably won't take our our Thursday night place. We'll probably do it a different night a week for the Dominican Republic, but it'll be open for whoever wants to get on and listen to it. <clears throat> anyway, I just thought I would bring that up and mention it. Um, tonight, I want to say a little bit about, you know, I know that Several of the brethren are talking during the week uh, live on Facebook also. And so um, maybe I'm bringing up a little bit, things that are a little bit different. Um, so um, I might mention here, some, uh, might mention the 15th chapter of Psalms and maybe look at the 90. 7th and 98 chapters concerning the coming of the Lord <clears throat> and maybe explain it a little bit um, uh, I, I, I don't know if I said the 15th chapter but I meant the 19th chapter of the book of Psalms um, just as a interlude to sort of get into what I'm saying about the coming of the Lord I think it was Brother Leniger that said that it took him over 25 years to understand the coming of the Lord. He said one day the Lord spoke to him and said, do you understand my coming? And he said, 
I thought about that for a minute, and I said, well, no, Lord, I don't guess I really do. And there are a lot of ideas about it, you know. Uh, I mean, some people, especially out in Babylon, feel like that, you know, the Lord's going to come and just catch his bride away at, at maybe, you know, any moment. We, we know that cannot happen. There's too much that has to happen prophetically before the Lord comes and makes up the remainder of his bride. <clears throat> and so, um, and then there's those that have a lot of ideology about it. Uh, you know, in the first chapter of Acts, isn't it, where Jesus is caught up in the clouds and an angel uh, the, the apostles are standing there beholding that and an angel uh, dressed in white clothing looks at them and says, why, why stand ye men here gazing upward? This same Jesus will come in like manner. And, uh, you know, so then in the book of Revelation in the first chapter, it says that he's coming in clouds. And so some people have the idea that Jesus is coming down to cloud level and when he comes back and gathers up the remainder of his bride. Well, I think those clouds are symbolic. I don't think you could look for Jesus come down to cloud level. Uh, <clears throat> I would, my position on that is, is that Jesus is coming back in a cloud of witnesses. That's a restored church, the cloud. If you remember in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, he's, John saw one like the Son of Man sitting on a cloud with a sickle in his hand. That wasn't a natural cloud. Jesus doesn't ride around on natural clouds. But that cloud was the the church, the restored church, and the sickle in his hand was the word of God in the, in the ministry that, that he was going to judge the world with and make that final reaping in the end of of the Gentile world, just like he reaped uh, a harvest in the end of the uh, Jewish world. And so <clears throat> if you look at the 19th chapter of the book of uh, Psalms, it, it's, sort of an, it's sort of an allegory, what is written here, of Jesus coming. And look what it says. It's starting the first verse. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. <clears throat> this is a natural picture of the natural heavens and, and uh, the firmament or the sky, but it also is symbolic. It shows you the heavens is the body of assemblies in the body of Christ as those that are in heavenly places. And, uh, uh, God manifests himself through his people. <clears throat> in He did this in the early church. He'll do it again in the restored church. It says, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Um, verse 4 says, their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Uh, in them that he set a tabernacle for the sun. <clears throat> it's showing the whole world, you know, and in a natural picture, you can, the whole world can look up and see the sun, the whole world can look up and see the sky, uh, the heavens. That's a, an amazing, uh, you know, picture that God lets us see something in the natural. But when the Lord manifested himself in the body of Christ in the early church, that those people were in a heavenly place and the power and demonstration of the spirit of God, the heavenly things were manifested to that world back there. And the Bible tells us it was manifested to the whole world and uh, back there. And that was that known world, and of course, it was that known world that God uh, appeared uh, appeared to those that were uh, that looked towards the Lord, toward the heaven, towards these heavenly things. There's people today. Did you know that <laughs> that are so earthly minded they don't ever look up. They don't ever even 
hardly recognize God's natural glory, much less his <clears throat> spiritual glory. Anyway, so uh, it'll go to the ends of this world. That doesn't mean it will not go to the end of uh, every nation. When it says the end of the world, it's talking about the Gentile world or the Jewish world. God was dealing with the Jews and the Jewish world and what Gentiles were uh, affected in that, in that harvest of the Jewish world and God giving through Christ this gospel over to the Gentiles. <clears throat> but we haven't had our harvest yet. We're, we're waiting on the restoration of the church for a harvest. And so the Lord will come down here exactly like he went back down, like he came back there. I've said several times, I'm looking for, I'm looking to see, I didn't think about doing this, or I maybe had something, I'm looking for something round, maybe that I would have, um, you know, like a ball. <clears throat> I'm trying, I wanted to show you how Jesus here, let me, I've got something over here I can't use. Okay, this is a light bulb. <laughs> but I'm just going to say, okay, this is the world. If Jesus comes down, <clears throat> which, you know, if he comes, he'll, he will come to Little Rock, Arkansas first. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, that's not true. But wherever, if he came naturally down to cloud level, it'd have to be somewhere in the world. So if he came down to cloud level to catch up his bride, how are the people over here or on this side of the world or down here? How are they going to see him? How are they going to be caught up? If they're down here, they'd be, they'd, be, they'd be being caught up, but they wouldn't be going where he's at. This is symbolic. It's not, you can't, you can't even fathom how that could be natural. That, but people don't think about that. They just think about where they're at. And so <clears throat> uh, he's coming back. He's coming back in clouds, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's a symbolic cloud. That's, and, and those clouds, it's a cloud of witnesses like, Paul mentioned in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelations. <clears throat> this God is, uh, he's gathering clouds together. In the Dominican Republic, I've, I've said to them several times because it's an island. And <clears throat> I've told them, I said, look, look how God works. I said, the Lord draws, you know, just showing in the, a picture of the natural. The Lord draws moisture up off the ocean. The ocean, the sea is a picture of people nations and tongues. I said, but God draws some. It's like moisture being drawn up from the ocean, from the sea. That's drawn up into a heavenly place. That's God's people. He draws them up into the heavens, the heavenly places. And then the wind, the wind blows and carries those clouds. And those clouds, while they're in heaven, in this caught up in the, this uh, uh, air pockets in heaven. It, it, it causes clouds to gather. They'll gather together and they'll get heavy with water. And finally, they'll drop water. So that's how God works. He, he moves across the world. He, he draws water up out of the sea, out of the, out of the people. He draws people up. And they get things from God, the spirit of God, and and this and that that spirit of God falls from that heavenly place or those people, what they've received from God, falls back on the earth. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. It's how God reaches out and touches people in the earth. And uh, <clears throat> so... <clears throat> I've taught that over there in the Dominican Republic, how that uh, the Lord, you know, it being an island, they they see little pockets of rain and clouds 
come over their island and, and drop water on their island that's caught up out of the sea over there. So it's just a picture to help them see and little, understand a little bit how God works. Well, uh, here in the 19th chapter of, of the book of Psalms, it it goes on to say <clears throat> that uh, their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. See, God's set a place here for the dwelling of the son of God, Jesus. That He's a picture of the sun itself. Everything evolves around him. He's the light of the world. Uh, without the sun, without light, there wouldn't be any life. And so he goes on to say, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. That's a picture of Jesus coming to harvest this world, uh, just like he harvested the Jewish world. He's going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. It's just a picture of the natural sun. You know, when the sun, when the sun comes out and gets near the earth, you know, it's another thing you have to consider about about God and the natural picture of of what God's created. We have seasons on the earth. You know, in the winter time, the earth in its orbit has got further away from the sun. That's why it's cold. That's why it's not, it's not near as hot. But as our orbit, as we, as, as the orbit takes us closer to the sun, then it gets hot. That's, you know, it gets summer, summertime, and it gets very hot. I don't know about where you're at, but here in Arkansas, it gets up in the hundreds in July and August, which we're getting close to running, you know, into those months. And that's a picture of God's judgment. It, uh, it'll scorch you, you know, if you don't, you have to get in and out, it's very dangerous to be out in, in that kind of heat. Uh, it's also very dangerous to be serving God when Jesus gets closer to the earth and manifests himself in judgment. See, God, he, he, he doesn't, he, God's not always judging with the judgment seat of Christ or even eternal judgment. That's one of the four major doctrines of the Bible is, the doctrine of laying on of hands, the doctrine of baptisms, the doctrine of resurrections, and the doctrine of eternal judgment. Uh, you have to understand eternal judgment. Uh, eternal, I was mentioning the other day that the word eternal means having no beginning and no end. There's really nothing eternal outside of God the Father. He's the eternal God. Jesus is the everlasting Father. He's everlasting, but he's not eternal. He has not always existed. He, he was created. He's the beginning and the end. He's the beginning of the creation of God. God created him first before he created anything else, and then Jesus created everything else. He created everything in heaven and in earth. He created the holy angels. He created, you know, Adam and Eve and the earth, everything has been created. Principalities and powers, they were all created for him and by him because it pleased God for him to have preeminence. That was God's will. He wanted his son. Uh, it's a picture. God wants other sons. He wants a family. He wants a family that has uh, uh, received his character and his power. Those bride members will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Look what Jesus even said to his apostles on the earth in that early church during that divine order. He told them, he said, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. He said, whosoever sins you re remit will be remitted and whoever sins you retain will be retained. He, he, he gave a lot of power to those men. But those uh, those men had to had to walk righteously with that power too. They could have they could have fell from it. Uh, Jesus had to walk righteously with it. Yeah, like Adam, when God created Adam, gave him dominion over the whole earth. 
uh, Jesus, when he was here, he had dominion. He was the second Adam. He could calm the sea. He could walk on the sea. He could heal. He could raise up and lay down. He, he had power. He gave power to his apostles like that. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, God wants a family. He wants those that can be trusted with uh, his character and his power. And so Jesus is coming back again. He's coming back again to harvest the world and he'll harvest it with judgment. The, the earth, uh, nothing is gonna be hid from the, from the heat thereof of this, the sun or the, the word of God and the manifestation of Christ. He's called the word of God. And, uh, you know, the, Jesus said the coming of the Lord was be as, as, it, as the lightning is from the east to the west. Well, <clears throat> that's not, you know, when I was in Babylon and before I understood things of God a little bit better, I thought that, that that was talking about lightning when it came a storm, you know, and it'd be a bolt of lightning in the sky. But it, do you know that it does not, the lightning doesn't, it doesn't, a bolt of lightning isn't from the east to the west. It's from the sky to the ground. <clears throat> that word lightning means illuminating. It's talking about the Son of God uh, illuminating the world uh, just like the sun comes up every morning in the east and it sets in the west. That's a picture of uh, uh, I don't know. Somebody just asked if they could get on our video. I, all, all they would have to do is go to on Facebook Mick Smith and go to my page and it's on live. So if, if you, I don't know if you can see what I'm saying but but, uh, <clears throat> and then someone else, somebody help me here if I need to do something from Jose Angel Edward Rodriguez is saying, bring them on camera. How can I do that? I don't know how to do that. Maybe you touch that. Uh, let me touch it and see what happens. No. I don't see that that does it. Oh, yeah. Okay, there. Yeah, it did work. Let me here. Let me help this other guy get in here. I didn't know you could do that. Okay, maybe I've got. Um, oh, I didn't know I could do that. Yeah, there. Okay. Anyway, so. Um, I'm talking about the coming of the Lord, and I'm, I'm just using the, the the natural picture that's drawn here in the 19th chapter of the book of Psalms to show, <clears throat> and I'm in the uh, uh, sixth verse where it said he's going forth, talking about a, he's a bridegroom coming out of his chambers, the, the sun, S-U-N, but this is a, the, the symbolic picture is the son of God as our bridegroom coming to us. And uh, it says that, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Uh, you know, there's a scripture where Paul said, in him there is neither uh, variableness nor shadow of turning. turning. <clears throat> uh, there is nothing hid, in other words, from the Lord. And I've used this illustration that you, you can, you know, you can stand up during the day if the sun is still in the east or part, just partially overhead. It's, let's just say it's 45 degrees away from you. Wherever you stand in the way of the sun will be, will make a shadow behind you. That's a dark place that the sun is not shining on your life. And every one of us have that. Until God shines completely on until God manifests us with a sevenfold light, a complete light where there is nothing hid from the heat of the sun, from the judgment of God, 
And we are to all want to be judged. Not, you know, I don't want to be fully judged of everything right now. I just want the Lord to judge me in his wisdom. He knows how to judge me. But he's to bring me to a full judgment. I've used the illustration that if you stand up directly under the sun, you can turn any direction you want to and there is no shadow because the sun is shining on you in every direction. That's where we are to come in serving God. We're to come to a place where he's directly shining a sevenfold light or complete light over all of us, showing any and everything uh, on all of us. And so uh, uh, we, want, we, we ought to want judgment. Judgment's not bad for God's people it's, that's endeavoring and uh, in a dedicated way to serve him and do what's right. Judgment is information. It's um, uh, investigation. You ought to want God to investigate you. God to uncover any and everything that you can in my life. Show me anything that needs to be done in my life. There, Sister Lucas. I don't know if you're doing that or not. Oh, pardon me while I take a cup of, sip of coffee. Anyway, so <clears throat> let's read a little bit further. Verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Uh, see, God's going to take you and I through it. He's going to take us through experiences. And those experiences are going to, that's our testimony what God takes us through, what we experience in God working in our lives and him directing our lives. That, that's our experience and it's our testimony and nobody has yours. It's like a fingerprint. Nobody has your exact testimony and you're going to overcome by your testimony, not by mine, not by your mother's or father's, your brothers or sisters, but you're going to overcome uh, uh, you know, you're going, <clears throat> you're going to overcome by the word of your testimony. <clears throat> uh, the fear of the Lord is clean, verse 9, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. See, God's a he's righteous in how he judges us. God's not judging you for his own benefit but he's judging you and I for our benefit. Uh, Paul said in Hebrews, he said, he chastises those whom he loves. Uh, <clears throat> he does it for us because he loves us. It's like a true mother or father that wants to raise their child. And because they love them, they correct them and they chastise them. That's judgment. That's judgment being applied to our, our life as we grow and mature in God. Uh, but finally, God is to take us into an eternal judgment. As I said, it's that, that word, it, eternal judgment means it's that judgment comes from God's nature. It's always existed. And God wants us to be righteous. He wants his eternal judgment to bring us to righteousness and <clears throat> I don't know, someone ought to even look uh, in the uh, in Hebrews. I'll look right quick. Hebrews the sixth chapter concerning what it says there about <clears throat> the doctrine of eternal judgments. We'll take but a second here. <clears throat> yeah. That word is in, it's, it is, that's a, that's a, 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 a gent, uh, I'm sorry, a Greek word. It's translated eternal 42 times and everlasting 25. Uh, I'd almost want to say that it should have been translated everlasting judgment because God's judgment 
is going to last forever. And once God's he's judged you completely and you, you, you've reached perfection through his judgment, then you're going to uh, live an everlasting life, not an eternal life because you haven't always existed, but you're going to, you're going to live without an, without an end to it. In other words, you'll continue on perpetually with, for an everlasting life. Um, let me back up a little bit. It says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Uh, <clears throat> it reminds me of the scripture in Proverbs. You know, it says, Hast thou found honey? Eat so much is sufficient for thee, lest thou vomit it. <laughs> that's a picture of the, that's a picture of the, the, uh, uh, word of God, the honey. Uh, it's rich. It's in fact you can you can you can get too much of the word of God. Did you know that? Uh, uh, and you don't you don't want to try to get more than you're able to comprehend. You know, just let the Lord develop you as as you grow and develop in the Lord. Otherwise, if you try to get more of God than you're capable of handling, you'll vomit it. That's what the scripture says. Hast thou found honey? Eat so much is sufficient for thee, least thou vomit it. You won't be able to maintain or keep or, or live the word of God that hasn't been worked in your life. And that, that's a growing measure. It takes time for that to happen. So all of us, you know, we have to grow and develop at our own pace. However, God is working and dealing with us. Um, uh, verse 11 says, more, to, more by them, uh, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. That's a beautiful picture of just looking at the natural world and see how the Lord comes and harvests the earth. Now I want you to turn with me to the 97th Psalm. <clears throat> I, want to, I want to look at the 97th and 98th Psalm. I've got time here. Um, because the, these two Psalms, I, uh, are a picture of Jesus coming in the end of the Jewish world, but he'll come in exactly the same way, the like manner in the end of the Jewish world when the church is restored. Jesus is coming to harvest this world. And uh, he's, you know, the Lord gave us so many wonderful, so many great things. That if you're not careful, it's almost like the children of Israel, you know, when they were going into the promised land, that some of them were pretty satisfied with just being in the valley on the other side of Jordan, not even going into the promised land. You can get blessed of God and think you got so much from God that you're satisfied where God has you. But I'm telling you, don't get satisfied until you know there's a finished work in you. I think you can know it. Paul knew it. He said, I finished my I finished my course. I fought a good fight and I finished. Wouldn't you like to say that? I do. I want to say that. I was thinking today, you know, I won't quite be 90 years old when the church is restored, if it's restored in the time frame that, that I have worked out, my position on time. 
but I'm not a real stickler about that. I, I've got an answer on trying, but, but I, I, I don't project that very much because it's been projected in the past by great men of God and they've missed it. And it's, you know, caused people to get ready for something that didn't happen. And it was a big letdown. I just say this, I know we're close to the end of the Gentile world. I don't know. I, I can tell you, you know, even what year I think the church is going to be restored. But remember this, there's a prophetical hour. That last prophetical hour is what's going to accomplish the, the final work of God. And even the latter part of that prophetical hour, some people think that's their silence going to be in heaven. I don't think you can use that scripture like that. I explain it maybe later down the road, but but there are going to be seven vials in the latter part of that last prophetical hour that will end in Armageddon. But God's judgment on this world, including Babylon and everything falls in it, God's going to judge. But before he does, he's going to make up his bride. If you remember in the 15th chapter of the book of uh, the 14th chapter, there's the harvest uh, of the Gentile world. In the 15th chapter, those seven vials are poured out. And it says that heaven will be shut up and no man will enter into the temple until after the, those seven vials are poured out. Oh, the, the bride will be made up and the judge will go, the world will go into judgment. And so there's a lot of things that has to happen here, but Jesus is going to come just like I wanted to, I want to read to you here in the 97th chapter of the book of Psalms. The 90, 98th is actually more emphatic to me in some ways, but Let's read uh, Psalms 97. It says, the Lord reigneth. Let me, let, me, let me see if I can. There, add Brother Winters to the camera. Okay. Uh, it said, the Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. See, Jesus is coming. He's coming in clouds. Uh, that's that's talking about people, people that uh, are in a in the restored church that's entered into the 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 mat, the full manifestation of God, and uh, darkness are round about him. That's that's just that's a picture of when it's real cloudy and it gets real dark. You know, it's fixing to rain. That's what that's talking about. The this the the early and the latter rain. See, the latter rain is coming on this Gentile world. We had our early rain, early uh, rain, and during Paul's day, that was the early rain on the Gentile world. But this is going to be our latter rain, uh, which is in the spring of the year in, in Israel. So, um, so that's a, you know, it's a, I wonder what I'm doing. I'm touching that button. that says, bring them on camera, brother Ron Johnson. Good to see you here. Anyway. So I'm talking about the coming of the Lord in, in uh, Psalms 97. Uh, so we know a rain is coming. We know that uh, the Lord is going to bless this earth with a full manifestation of his spirit. That's a picture of, a, uh, of the latter rain. His righteousness and judgment are the inhabitation of his throne. Uh, a fire goes before him and burneth up the enemies round about him. That's talking about judgment. His lightning in uh, enlighteneth the world the earth saw and trembled see that happened when Jesus was on this earth and when his disciples uh, were operating after he went back to heaven those men had the power of God and the anointing of God people were afraid of them. Uh, his lightnings the illuminating of, of the world by the power and manifestation of the spirit the earth saw that and they trembled when they felt the power of God. And when those men began to 
operate. Paul said, I came to you not in man's wisdom, but in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. That's not talking about, uh, that's not talking about uh, uh, natural hills. Hills, you know, uh, a, a, a hill represents religion, something religious. It's a, it's a rise up from the earth. It's a high, higher place. And there's all kinds of religious influences that are little hills. There's even mountains of religion, these big organizations. But they've melted before the presence of the Lord uh, of, the whole, of the earth. The heavens declare his righteousness and all, all the people see his glory. They didn't all accept it, but they saw it. Confound it be all they that serve graven images that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. Zion heard and was glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoiced because of thy judgments, O Lord. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his servants. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks unto the remembrance of his holiness. To me, <laughs> it blesses me to read scriptures and get in this vein of thought with, with the word of God especially in the world we're living in today. Can you believe what's going on in the United States of America? My gosh, I, I, just, I, I just can't hardly fathom what's going on. <laughs> it's just, to me, it's such stupidity. It's such ignorance going on that the world is completely uh, irrational. In, in, in their actions, at least, and, and the media is eating it up and feeding it to the people. Excuse me. Psalms 98. Now this, look, this is where Jesus came to that early church back there also. It says, O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. You know, he's he's coming. Um, he's coming with um, with his right hand. This is, of course, talking about the early church. But uh, I believe it's in Isaiah. Let me stop right there and just see if I, I can locate that for you in Isaiah. Yeah, uh, in in the fortieth chapter of Isaiah, let me just read. This. So it says uh, Isaiah forty says uh, the tenth verse says, "Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and His arm shall rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, and His work." before him he'll feed his flock like a shepherd he'll gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in in his bosom and shall gently lead them that are with young see jesus is coming with strong hand that's the that's the ministry apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers he's coming with a strong hand in his arm that's jesus Jesus, God's arm, which is Christ, reaches all the way down into the earth. And there's a hand on the end of it, which is his ministry. And they, uh, his arm will rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. And his arm will gather, you know, just like you reach out and gather somebody up with your arm and your hand. And shall gently lead those that are with young. Then in verse 12 says, he measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. 
uh, <clears throat> you know that song, he's got the whole world in his hand. Well, that's true. He measures the waters. We're part of the waters. We're a, we're, we start out of this world. And God gets us in his hand with his ministry and measures us or judges us. He sees whether or not there's anything measured in us that's worthy of salvation. And he meted out heaven with a span. You know what a span is? A span is a measurement in the Bible. It's, it's it, let's see if I can, it's three palm widths. You can go three palm widths. Well, there was one palm width in the early church. He measured out that, that he measured out heaven with a, with one palm width there. He measured out another. He's going to measure out another one down here in the end of this world in his harvest. And he's going to uh, measure out those that can be righteous. That's got enough, something measurable in them that God can, can change them from a, a wicked, vile, uh, human, fallen natured person to a righteous child of God. A miracle. God's going to do that. That'd be that'd be the second measurement of the span. Then the third is the millennial reign. God's going to make up his his everlasting family out of a measurement, three measurements in the world, which is a span. So go back to the ninety eighth chapter of of Psalms. So God, here I read uh, his in the very first verse. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. See, that, that right hand working with Jesus in the early church in that harvest got him the victory and made up bride members that's going to rule with him and reign with him for a thousand years. Jesus, he not only judged the righteous and caused them to be worthy of everlasting life, but he also judged the world. He judged Israel. He judged that world back there and showed they were unworthy. They were judged with eternal judgment or everlasting judgment, you could say. The Lord hath made known his salvation. He fully manifested his salvation in that early church. He will again down here. He's manifested tremendous things to us, but there's far yet more to come, saints. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. That's talking about the early church. When Paul said that, you know, the whole world saw that manifestation. That's talking about the, the Jewish world that God was dealing with. He'll do the same thing with the Gentile world that he's dealing with down here, the 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 many the the uh, millennial world, he'll do the same thing with. Everyone down here won't see and hear the full manifestation of this, but it, but all that God's dealing with, all that's in the world that God's dealing with, to make up the remainder of His bride. Um. Uh, it says, verse 4 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp. With the harp, the voice of the psalm. With trumpets and sound of cornet. Make a loud noise before the Lord, the King. That's just ways, of, it's just really talking about rejoicing. And also a message in your rejoicing. That's a trumpet, was a trumpet message. That's what it's symbolic of. Then look what it says, verse 7. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. You can be assured that when this restored church begins to manifest the fullness of God, in this earth, in the end of the Gentile world, it's going to make this world mad. The, the the nations uh, were angry, the Bible says, in the book of Revelation. Yes, it's going to make them angry because it's going to bring judgment on them. It's going to tear up their playhouse. It's going to tear up their idols of religion and 
Yeah, even the Christian religion that they're going to have that's full of falsehood, it's going to tear all that up, and many people are going to get angry. It's going to stir up the the sea is going to roar like a like a tumult on the sea that is going to begin to churn, and the world is going to bring lots of persecution. But they're not going to be able to. They won't be able to withstand the manifestation of God uh, in the end of this world. Let the floods clap. Let their let their hands let the uh, clap their hands. Let, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for He cometh to judge the earth with righteousness. Shall He judge the world and the people with equity? Yes, the Lord's coming, and he's going to judge this world. He's going to judge it, uh, and he's coming, just like it says in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. He's coming in clouds, and that's certainly not a natural cloud. He's coming to judge this world, and just as Peter said, judgment first must begin at the house of God first. He will have to judge. Uh, he'll have to bring judgment. Uh, uh, to the to the church first, judgment's going to have to come to the church, and uh, we, we we can't God can't use us to judge the world if we can't stand in judgment ourselves. But the Lord will the Lord will take us through judgment, and then He'll begin to use His people to judge this world with information with with investigation, with correction, even uh, chastisement, and even damnation if, uh, as it's necessary. God's wrath eventually gets poured out on those that don't, who doesn't turn to him. But look, I'm, I'm looking to the right, to the good part of judgment, the righteous part of judgment. And you should too. If you're God's child, you ought to say, Lord, judge me. Cleanse me, oh Lord. Uh, Bring judgment in my life. Don't be, uh, uh, you know, don't be uh, uh, fearful of God's judgment. But but and, and and don't be yeah don't be fearful like you know God's not going to judge you if you say oh God judge me that God's got he's got more wisdom he's not gonna it's just like if a little bitty child said you know, uh, correct me all you need to. You're not going to mistreat that child. You're going to, you're going to give them correction as they need it in a tender and gentle way. You may have to get strong at times, but you're going to try to bring them up as a child, knowing that they have the understanding of a child. God will do the same thing. Uh, he, he just, he winks at some things. God, God doesn't, Listen to everything we say, because half, the, well, I won't say half, but part of the time we don't realize what we're saying to the Lord. But uh, anyway, look, you and I are serving a tremendous God, righteous in all of his ways. His judgments are righteous judgment. Open your heart to judgment. Don't close your heart to the Lord. Just let him deal with you. Tell him to make, help, you know, pray and ask God to make you tender. And let him deal with in your life. Let him help mold you. And, and, you know, sometimes you have to practice yielding to God. Do you feel God dealing with your life? Well, try to learn how to, to yield over, even to the Spirit of God. As the Spirit of God deals with you, learn how to, try to learn how to yield when you feel God dealing with you. So, so that we can get into practice of yielding over to God as he begins to deal with our lives and tries to shape us and mold us in his own way. Anyway, praise God. I know I'm running out of time, but certainly I love the word of God and I love these precious truths. And uh, I'm looking for the coming of the Lord. I think he is coming. He's already coming. Uh, he's He's coming to, to gather his people together in a He's coming back in a cloud of witnesses to catch us up into a second heaven condition and finish the work. It's going to take a second heaven condition. 
we're going to have to get in a second heaven condition. We're not, we can't stay out in the outer courts and get this accomplished. It's going to take a sevenfold light. It's going to take the unadulterated 12 loaves of unleavened bread of the, of the 12 uh, doctrine of the 12 apostles. And God's restoring all of that, and he's going to give us those things in their completeness in this final harvest that he's going to uh, accomplish in the end of this world. God bless your hearts. Uh, keep looking up. L lift your heads, O ye gates, and the king of glory will come in. God bless you. I love you all. Pray for me. I'll pray for you. Once again, good night. The people in in uh, Little Rock, I'll see you Sunday morning uh, uh, in the dining room at 9.30, breakfast at 10 o'clock, just a uh, continental-type breakfast. I think they're having oatmeal, uh, maybe some yogurt with fruit and uh, some donuts, what have you, hot coffee. Anyway, then we'll have Bible study and, and church service at 1130. God bless your hearts once again. Good night.